Where is private equity putting its money these days? We're reporting today from the INSEAD Private Equity Conference, and we're joined by Graham Oldroyd, who is a partner in Bridgepoint. Thank you very much for being with us. Bridgepoint's a mid-market private equity firm. Our target investment level is companies with an enterprise value from 200 million to just over a billion. And we invest right the way across that range, um, right the way across Europe. Um, we have a fund that enables us to invest on a multi-sector basis, but nevertheless, we have sector teams for six primary sectors that are our focus for investment. Uh, that is healthcare, support services, financial institutions, consumer retail, TMT, and the area I look after, which is manufacturing and industrials. Okay, in manufacturing and industrials, I mean, the world would think, the layman would think, where on earth is there opportunity in that when everyone is talking about nanotechnology and cloud computing and... Um, we would distinguish from the venture capital um, high technology space to the core businesses in established industries where we're investing. Uh, within those, there are some very mature industries and they're probably not such a good hunting ground for private equity. Our focus is looking at the end markets and saying, and analyzing global situations and looking for drivers to those end markets and picking those spots where we see long-term growth drivers. Um, and so it's matching macro and micro analysis, micro at the level of the individual company, macro for the market driver. Um, to give examples, um, in, in aerospace, there are um, expected long-term growth in that industry. Um, automotive, there isn't. Um, I think you need to look at uh, what is, what, you know, it's consumer behavior ultimately that is underlying these things. Consumer demand, um, uh, you know, healthcare, uh, med tech is another area uh, where without looking too far, you can rapidly see that uh, aging populations are going to create demand for uh, greater, greater medical care and with that, more medical technology. Um, there's demand for water, um, for food agrochemicals. Um, these are individual segments where with a little analysis you can see that there's going to be strong demand and then we can pick those companies that are going to serve that demand and grow in doing so. so what is driving then your investments in, in manufacturing? What do you actually look for? It, it go, we go straight away to the growth driver, the end market, and looking at the opportunity to in the course of our uh, investment time period, we're looking to double the size of a company typically. Part of that will be organic growth. Part of it will be by acquisitions, market consolidation. The test we have, which is actually fairly generic across a lot of different segments, is does a company have pricing power? And if its raw materials or its input costs in other forms rise, is it able to pass on those costs to its customers? If it is, it says something about the demand for that for those products, the demand for those services, and it probably reveals that they're not commoditized. It so give, give me an example then of, without necessarily being specific in terms of name, but the kind of investment that you maybe said no to and one that you went into heavily. We would typically stay away from uh, a sector like automotive components where uh, the major OEMs uh, are, are concentrating on a price down regime. So every year you could expect your uh, your customer to be coming to you for a 2%, 3% even price reduction. It's very, very hard to, to grow your, your bottom line against that continuing pressure. Mm -hmm. Equally, the kind of business that we do look for um, uh, is one where um, it has an established market position, perhaps in a geography or a particular range of products um, that, is, that is clearly unassailable or very strong indeed. And then we can leverage that and extend into new geographies add complementary products, strengthen the management team, and really drive forward on the sales side. Um, and if we look at businesses in our own portfolio that have those characteristics, um, in the past we've had uh, you know, lighting business. Uh, lighting is a very difficult general industry. The company had some great products, um, and it produced long life um, uh, strip lighting. Um, but it targeted uh, instances where uh, the cost of relamping, the cost of fitting the lamp, was many, many times more than the cost of the lamp itself. So the extra life of the lamp, the fact you needed to fit less frequently, suddenly became a, a huge uh, a demand driver. 
and it was supplying offshore oil rigs, nuclear power stations, cold rooms, um, uh, the baggage handling areas in airports. These are, these are all locations where you don't want somebody going in and putting up a ladder uh, any more often than you absolutely have to. Uh, simple simple things, but you try and do it well, you've got a differentiated product, you do have the pricing power, and you've got a proposition to your end customer that is um, uh, you know, uh, demanding. So how do you keep your eye on what's coming up next while you're worried about all these bag baggage handlers working in the dark? What is, what is, how do you keep your eye on the next, the next trend? Because this seems brilliantly, brilliantly elegant, simple, but it's not because you have to really think about it. You think about it, but uh, ultimately there is a we, we see a, in, in Bridgepoint approximately between 500 and 700 transactions every year. Um, the discipline, because ultimately of those, we're going to invest in five. And there is a discipline in cutting out those that are going to be non-starters very quickly, but then working very, very hard on the last 50. And it's at that point then, you know, gut feel will have got us a long way into establishing the overall market dynamics, um, but then we do a lot of work to get into really, really understanding the detail. What made you get into private equity? There are very, very few professions that require the full range of skills that are needed in private equity. It's not just all finance. You need to understand sales, you need to understand a very wide range of different companies. There's quite a lot of legal work, but importantly as well, it's working with very intelligent people and uh, partnership, negotiation, um, and having a drive to really deliver our performance. Where are we going in the next year or two or three? Well, there's no doubt about it that the general uh, underlying dynamic, government spending is going to be in many cases constrained in a lot of different countries. So some of the areas that have been supported by effectively the central exchequer uh, are now going to be weaker. Um, but in other areas there is still a strong underlying growth and of course you know, the growth in the Far East is an opportunity for exporters from Europe. And you're pretty bullish on that in, the, in terms of where you're putting some of your money? Yes, we are. I think um, it's again a case of being selective. Um, there is no point going head to head on a, a low added value product and delivering it into the Far East and expecting it to be a winner. Uh, you're going to be against local competitors who are probably producing it as well as you are at a lower price. Um, but there is certainly Far East demand for high quality branded European products that are differentiated and have some intellectual property that is, is just not there for the local competitors. Is that going to be Europe's and perhaps the US, let's just say the industrialized world's role is to have, as you said, that intellectual property that kind of difference that, at least for the time being, that differentiates itself from what might have been a commoditized item <laughs> otherwise? <laughs> Uh, well, it'll be one of the roles, but I don't think it'll be the only one. I think what is very interesting is well, we shouldn't forget the, the European market and the U.S. market remain um, you know, enormously important markets. Um, and the advantage as well they have for businesses is that they have predictable legal structures. A contract here has value, can be relied on. Um, this applies for the whole of the value chain around that, so it applies to your customers and your suppliers. Um, there is this unpredictability that still goes with dealing with some countries in the Far East. Um, and uh, against that background, it is still a lot easier to do business in Europe. Great. Well, thank you very much, Graham Oldroyd, for being with us on NCAD Knowledge. Thank you.